Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our engaged session this month featuring web and getting a launch update from the project. The engaged series was created in order to engage the NASA and Goddard workforce in specific missions, projects, technologies, etc. In this virtual environment, we have expanded that to a larger population outside of the workforce. A couple of housekeeping items to go through before we get started. First, the chat feature on the right hand side of the screen has been enabled and in order for you to interact and ask questions of our speakers today. There will be a question and answer period at the end of the panel and we will try to get through as many of the questions that you put in the chat as we can, but we can't make any promises that we'll get through all of them. Also, if you require closed captioning, please hover over the CC button at the bottom of the of the video. If closed captioning is not working today, the recording will be made available to everybody with closed captioning at the recording at the time. Now I would like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Laura Betts, the communications team lead for the web project at Goddard, will serve as our moderator today. Dr. Stephanie Milam is the deputy project scientist for planetary science on the web project. Paul Geithner is the deputy project manager for technical on the web project. It is truly an honor to have that we have these three amazing speakers with us here today to talk about web and its upcoming launch. I do not want to take any more of the time, so I will turn it over to the James Webb video to kick everything off. This is your telescope, an engineering marvel, an exploration powerhouse. Use it to look back in time and explore the first galaxies that formed after the Big Bang. To peer into atmospheres of planets orbiting the stars. It's your eyepiece to the uncharted, unknown, and unimagined. This is the largest, most complex, and challenging space telescope ever constructed. It will change our understanding of the universe and our place in it. The James Webb Space Telescope. Equipped with the largest primary mirror ever to be flown in space at six and a half meters, it's more than six times the size of the Hubble Space Telescope primary mirror. Webb's four cutting edge infrared instruments and cameras operate at super cold temperatures. Temperatures colder than the surface of Pluto. Getting this cold is done with the help of the largest sun shield ever flown. A five layer tennis court sized sun shield that blocks heat from the sun, earth and moon. Webb will be the first telescope to detect light from the most distant galaxies in the universe. These first galaxies formed about 13 and a half billion years ago, only 300 or so million years after the Big Bang. Webb carries advanced technologies to tackle some of the most fundamental questions about the universe. How did the first galaxies form and evolve? Are there chemical signatures of the building blocks of life on other worlds? Is our solar system unique? Launching such a large telescope into space is an incredible engineering challenge. Fully deployed, Webb is too large to fit inside any rocket fairing. Engineers designed it to be folded, like origami, to squeeze inside the European Space Agency's five meter diameter Ariane 5 rocket fairing. After launch, controllers on the ground deploy Webb remotely. Deployment is an intricate ballet. For nearly three weeks, controllers carefully unfold Webb. After this delicate dance, Webb's golden mirrors are precisely aligned using motors behind each hexagonal mirror segment, adjusting them to form one perfect mirror. Once the instruments are fully cooled, the exploration will begin. 
web is a technological challenge like no other, born of the efforts of thousands of people across the United States, Canada, and Europe. The James Webb Space Telescope is your telescope. Use it to explore, to challenge theories, to see sights yet unseen. It's yours to unfold the beauty and mystery in the universe and our place in it. Good morning. Thank you for watching. And I'm so excited to tell you more about NASA's James Webb Space Telescope. We're launching this amazing telescope this fall from French Guiana. And our two experts are absolutely fascinating to hear from. So you have Dr. Milam and we have Paul Geithner here. So Webb will study every phase of the history of our universe once it's launched ranging from the first luminous glows after the Big Bang to the formation of solar systems capable of supporting life systems on planets like Earth to the evolution of our own solar system. And we are so lucky to hear from these experts. So just before we get started, will we be able to hear a little bit more from you both on what your roles are on web? So let's start off with Dr. Marlon Stephanie. Sure, um, thanks for having me. I'm Stephanie Milam. I work at Goddard Space Flight Center. And as was said, I'm uh, the deputy project scientist for planetary science. So my role on web was actually um, to make sure that this incredible, sensitive, state-of-the-art facility that's designed to see the first stars and galaxies of the universe far, far away, um, can actually do things in our own solar system, which happen to be some of the biggest and brightest things in the sky, not to mention um, they move really, really fast. And if you saw the video, you see that James Webb is actually this sort of sailboat looking type facility, and it's really challenging to make it move fast enough to be able to track up objects in our solar system. Um, but we were able to do so such that now we can see things like Mars, um, we have programs that are already designed and ready for cycle one to observe Mars, asteroids, near-Earth asteroids, comets, um, and just about every object in the solar system sort of Mars on outwards. So um, that was my role, and uh, I can't wait for launch and science to begin. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. And you just had an asteroid named after you. I did. Um, I'm so grateful uh, for working with the asteroid community on this project, um, just so that we can make sure we can do some science with them. And my um, my thanks I got in return was getting my own rock. So that's incredible. How cool. Thank you for being with us today. And Paul, could you uh, give us a little more info about what you do on the project? Sure. Um, I'm Paul Geithner, and I am currently the deputy project manager for technical and verification here at Goddard. Um, Goddard is manages the overall uh, web mission. Um, I've had several jobs on web. Uh, I started in 1997 after just finishing the first, the uh, second servicing mission to Hubble. And I'm my first job was being the, the mission systems engineer. And uh, back then, you know, web was was a lot of uh, cartoons and charts and um, you know ideas. It, there was almost no real hardware or technology that was advanced enough to make it feasible. And um, I also spent a little bit of time at headquarters um, working on the mission from there. And I've been observatory manager. And uh, this is my latest position on the on the uh, project. Didn't think I'd spend a huge chunk of my career on it, but but. Um, it's worked out because it's an amazing machine that's going to do amazing things. Great, thank you very much. So this is a question for you both. Since you both have worked on this for so long, what is exciting you about this so much, like science-wise? Like what are you most anticipating and most excited about to come back from this telescope? So let's start with Stephanie. I think I'm most excited about the things that we don't know that we're going to discover yet. Um, as with every uh, mission that we've had, um, especially in astrophysics, um, even in planetary science, heliophysics, earth science, every time we put something in space, there are things that we find that we never anticipated. 
Um, the discovery space is wide open um, because this is a telescope that complements the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's going to be looking in a whole new light at the universe. And basically, we're going to get to probe things that we were never able to study in the kind of detail with the sensitivity and the capability of Webb with, that we've ever had with any other with, with any other telescope. And personally, um, I'm a cometary scientist, so of course I'm very excited about the things that we're going to do for comets. Um, studies on, you know, the composition, seeing how they become active, following them through their journey in and out of the solar system. There's all kinds of amazing things that I'm, I'm really looking forward to in the next few years. And Paul? Uh, I think Stephanie said it really well. I mean, some of the greatest discoveries of Hubble, for example, were basically answers to questions that nobody thought to ask or had imagined to ask um, when it was being designed and built. And same here, you know, this telescope was first being talked about before Hubble was even launched. You know, a large infrared optimized telescope in space, um, primarily to, to look at uh, uh, the very first luminous objects to form in the universe. And um, but but uh, since we started on web you know the whole field of astrobiology and um exoplanets that's a new thing and you know that's stephanie's specialty right and those are those are relatively new fields and they didn't exist when people were first thinking about web but but web is an an, an almost ideal machine to to um to use to uh do those investigations so yeah you know, that's really exciting i mean the other missions have found uh habitable uh well planets in the habitable zone of their parent stars right where they could have liquid water and web will have the capabilities to the has the capability to perhaps you know detect the chemistry of in the atmosphere of those planets and maybe identify things like water or carbon dioxide or methane or diatomic oxygen the kind of stuff we know that on our one example in the whole universe where life exists that you know uh those are conditions associated with life and can support it so that that's hugely exciting um and you know i'm not even a scientist i'm an engineer and i'm pretty jazzed about the whole the whole thing so yeah awesome well there's a lot to look forward to and to add to that paul like what in particular makes this an engineering marvel like why is this so different than other projects yeah this is this is real this is a really hard engineering um challenge uh the the, it, the the hardest part is the 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 size um together with the temperature of operation so you know when it comes to a telescope bigger is better um performance increases dramatically with the size of your main optic or aperture as we call it so um and to be super sensitive you want a really big telescope and this thing's huge it's so big that, um, first of all, the science requires it to be as big as it is. Unfortunately, uh, there are no available um, launch vehicle fairings that are big enough to uh, hold this thing in its operational condition. So we had to design it to be uh, folded up and then to be commanded to be opened um, once it's in space. It's like, it's like the biggest, most, um, it's like the grandest high-tech origami you can imagine. So, um, oh, but that's not all. So the telescope and the instruments, um, which are behind a big uh, ten tennis court sized um, umbrella to shield them from the sun and the earth, uh, that stuff has to be cold. So why is cold important? Well, this is a telescope that sees mainly infrared light and infrared light is wavelengths of light just a little longer than we can see with our eyes so they're a little redder than red and we don't um we don't see it with our eyes but you can feel it as heat like all of us are bright shining blazing objects at eight microns right so um which is about 10 times the wavelength of red light so uh if you want an infrared telescope to be really sensitive and so it's not seeing blinded by its own heat from its own temperature. You want it to be super cold. So we built this thing at room temperature. We polished all its mirrors at room temperature 
But as everybody knows, things expand when they get hot and they shrink when they get cold. And this thing is going to operate at a few tens of degrees above absolute zero. So we actually had to build it precisely wrong at room temperature so it will be exactly correct at its operating temperature and have um, essentially perfect optics. And uh, that's, that's a hard problem. Uh, there are, you know, we have a cryo branch at Goddard and they totally understand this kind of stuff, but a lot of people don't appreciate uh, how hard uh, cryogenic engineering is. And this thing is, uh, yeah, so size plus cryogenics makes for a really hard problem. And so because it's so large, it's bigger than any rocket that could send it out into space. So you're saying that it has to fold up like origami to fit inside that Ariane 5 rocket that's a contribution from the European Space Agency. But how does it open up out in space, Paul? So we're, we're commanding it. Um, there's lots and there are um, hundreds of mechanisms, motors, pulleys, cables, uh, stem drives that deploy the, the uh, structures. A lot of them are dedicated to the sunshield, which is a which is a real challenge because it's not made of rigid things. It's made of things that will float around. So we have to control those things so they don't get snagged on each other. But it's going to be two weeks of um, uh, command sent from the ground. And I'd like to contrast it with the whole seven minutes of terror thing for Mars entry, descent, and landing. So I, I'm not casting shade on, on that. It's just a different problem. So when EDL, ascent, entry, descent, and landing happens, Mars is 11 light minutes away but it's a seven minute process so that means it's all over and done with before engineers ever even receive a signal that it has started and that whole thing is a pre-programmed stored command sequence and and props to those folks they've they've made it look easy and it's not but it's a completely different problem it's a pre-programmed thing there's a lot of smarts on that um uh spacecraft and it it does it itself basically we're just watching it happen there's no joysticking with us um it's there's a lot more steps involved and we're only light seconds away so we'll be commanding it in real time and we'll have the flexibility in case something doesn't go quite right we'll be able to back things up or stop or do things in a different order and make sure it all gets gets deployed. But yeah, those first couple of weeks of, are uh, all about deploying it from its folded up condition to this this uh, deployed condition that you see me in, in uh, the background here. Awesome. So question for you, um, just so everyone knows, like, what's the current status of Webb? Where is it at? And what's next for the telescope? So after 25 years of NASA spending money on it and it being a real project, it is, it's built and we're in the final stowing for launch process. Um, it's, at the, it's in the big clean room out at um, Northrop Grumman's Space Park facility in Redondo Beach, California. Um, we'll be putting it into its shipping container in about a month and a half. And when when we get the word that we're ready to uh, be received down at our launch site, um, then we'll we'll um, we'll close the freeways in the middle of the night. We'll drive it down to uh, Seal Beach Naval Station. We'll get on a ship and we will sail to uh, French Guiana and pull in right to the port for the spaceport there. And um, that'll take about two weeks. And then we're then we're um, on in the um, a 55 day launch campaign and we'll be ready to launch at the end of November. All right, very cool. So Stephanie, uh, this is a question for you. How does Webb compare to Hubble? Um, so as I kind of alluded to earlier, um, it's complementary to Hubble. We do have um, some capability that overlaps with it, which is sort of a really cool thing um, when we start thinking about how we can use them together. 
Um, you can actually do like stereo imaging um, so of things that are close enough to us. So there's been some simulations done on how to do like stereo imaging of uh, a comet that's close enough to Earth or an asteroid using both of the telescopes at the same time. So you get sort of a 3D image. Um, that's just sort of a fun thing as an aside. Um, science wise though, uh, JWST actually operates at much longer wavelengths. Um, so we go into the infrared all the way out into the mid infrared. Um, so about 0.7 microns to um, just over 20 microns. So we can do things that, um, first of all, uh, Hubble could never do, uh, at, and but at sort of the same sort of sensitivity and resolution of Hubble. So you can think of all these beautiful things that we can see with Hubble, these images, these beautiful maps of star forming regions, these clouds and pillars of you know planet formation. Um, Webb can actually do those same types of images, but instead of seeing the optical light, the dust and the clouds that's being reflected, just like clouds in our own um, in our own atmosphere or blocking light, uh, Webb can actually see through those clouds. So we're going to get to see into the dust and the gas now and see how these planets are forming um, and stars are forming and uh, follow that whole sort of evolutionary sequence that we haven't been able to really probe with the sensitivity that Webb will enable. Also at these longer wavelengths, we're gonna do things like characterization. We have spectroscopic capability now that we haven't had um, before with any, any other infrared telescope. So we, we have sensitivity and spectroscopic coverage. So as Paul was saying, you know, we can do characterization of planets around other stars and see what their atmospheres are actually made of. We can study plumes coming out of moons in our own solar system and see whether or not they have molecules that are needed to sustain life. Um, things like water, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane, um, how crazy the chemistry may possibly be. Uh, we could do follow-up studies to planetary science missions um, because they didn't have wavelength coverage out to the wavelengths that we have. So things like the Cassini telescope, we didn't have the capability that we'll have with Webb, Right now, we're not going to be right there next to the moon of Titan. We will be um, at a good enough resolution that we can actually see sort of things going across um, the planet itself. So um, it's very complementary, not quite the same, but we are, if you think about it, it's sort of the same sort of pixel scale, just at a different wavelength. Cool. And I've, I've heard another scientist often describe the telescope sun shield kind of like the tube of a telescope. Paul, could you get into that and tell me a little bit about how that compares? Sure. I mean, the, the telescope that probably, the, the sort of telescope a lot of people picture in their minds when they hear telescope is, is a tube, right, with lenses or mirrors in it. Um, and the Hubble looks kind of like the telescope you might have at home. Or, um, But what's weird about Webb or unusual in that case is we're not in a tube. We're actually behind a big kite-shaped um, uh, umbrella, and uh, the main reason for doing that is is um, uh, you that this thing has to get cold, and the way it gets cold is by sh by radiating its heat to deep space. And if it were stuck inside a tube, it would have a very tough time doing that. But by being, um, you know, on on the shady side of this big tennis court sized kite shaped five layer sun shield it can radiate its heat. So if you think of the desert, right, the desert is a place where there's very little, there's no clouds, very little water vapor. And in the daytime, it's blazing hot, right? But at nighttime, it gets pretty freaking cold. And um, that's because all that heat at nighttime can radiate to space and it can go right through the atmosphere and out to deep space. Well, you know, where we're going, we're gonna have we're gonna have the uh, Earth and the Moon and the Sun always on the sunny side. This side, my hand doesn't disappear. And um, the telescope and the instruments, which need to get cold, will always be in the shade, and they will get they will naturally get to these super cold temperatures that they need to get to. We we actually need the telescope optics themselves to be less than sixty Kelvin, so that um, our limitation on the um, sensitivity of this machine is um, is the environment we're flying in. So there's 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 a diffuse dust in the inner solar system. Stephanie should probably talk about this, and not me. But there's a diffuse dust in the inner solar system, and it it emits and reflects 
a little bit of its own infrared light. It's called the zodiacal light. And um, so we're flying in the solar system. That's where we're going to be orbiting. And um, when you add up the thermal background noise from the tel- temperature of the telescope and the electronics noise and the dark current from the detectors, and you add all that up, it's actually less. The sum of that is less than the natural background we're flying in. So we're actually limited. Our sensitivity is limited by the environment we're flying in, not by the the imperfections or shortcomings of the machine itself, which is pretty amazing. That's really freaking sensitive. And um, it's going to enable people like Stephanie to do some really cool science. Awesome. And what are you most excited about this telescope, Stephanie, in terms of science and what you're looking forward to do? Um, so we have a whole suite of science that's already been slated for the first year of operations of the telescope. Um, and it includes everything from, I'll say soup to nuts, or I can say endoplanets to exoplanets or the beginning of time to now. Um, there's all, all kinds of ways to think of it. Um, as I was saying earlier, things like watching star formation actually in real time, um, studying that process, I think is a really cool area of study that um, we are kind of getting insights with some of our ground-based telescopes that operate at much longer wavelengths, but this is really gonna help us make that final connection that we really need to study the chemistry, the dynamics and the physics of the, of the whole process. Um, I think things in the solar system with the sensitivity of JWST, we actually are going to get to see the outer solar system in ways that we've never been able to do. Uh, Webb is so sensitive that we can now do studies of every known Kuiper Belt object. So these these icy rocks that are way out, you know, in the area of Neptune and Pluto. Um, they're usually too small or dark or just not quite radiating the way that we need to to really study them with ground-based telescopes. Um, so uh, JWST is really going to start probing what the composition of these things are, how big and how small they actually are. And that tells us about how our own solar system actually formed as well um, and what all that seed material was to, to instigate, you know, the planets that we have, the the asteroid belt, the Kuiper belt, um, the moons and satellites, um, all of it is all very intermediate or intimately intertwined with, you know, how all of what, what the composition was when, when our solar system was actually forming. Um, so I'm really, really excited about that. Um, I'm not an astrophysicist, so I can't say a whole lot about um, galactic evolution or those types of things, but I know that um, that's sort of what was the bread and butter design of this telescope. So I'm, I can only imagine the things that we're going to be doing for astrophysics um, and galaxy formation and evolution and basically rewriting the books the same way Hubble did. Hey, Laura, can I say something about that? That's Go for it. Way. I'm not a, I'm not a scientist, but, but I know enough about the early universe stuff. I just want to throw out there that, you know, people go, well, why, why is, why is it infrared for that? Well, if you want to see the very first uh, ultraviolet and visible light emitted by the very first luminous objects in the universe, it happened so long ago that you need an infrared telescope today to see it. And that's because the universe has been expanding since its beginning and light as it's traveling through expanding space, it's getting stretched. Imagine a slinky getting stretched out. So it's sort of like the Doppler effect, but not the same thing. So so light from the ver- from the very early, you know, the end of the dark ages, the time when the universe, lights turned on in the universe, when the first stars formed, the first galaxies formed, whatever the first luminous objects were, we don't know. We want to go and observe that epoch. And that was ultraviolet and visible light when it was emitted, but it shows up to, today, over 13 and a half billion years later, stretched out into the infrared spectrum. And that, that's why this thing originally was, was an infrared telescope. So, um, uh, yeah, and why do galaxies matter? Well, galaxies are the universe's large collections of ordinary matter and dark matter and we live in one so it matters um to to uh, understand well how do galaxies form and you know we see giant black holes that are millions the mass of our sun at the heart of a lot of galaxies contemporary galaxies well how did how did that happen because you know hubble can see almost as far as we want to go but not quite it doesn't have the wavelength coverage it doesn't have the sensitivity 
but it sees galaxies. It sees lots of galaxies. And well, how did, you know, what came first, stars, galaxies, black holes? How did supermassive black holes form so relatively quickly? There's so many questions about the early universe that, you know, I as a as an amateur am like, you know, blown away by. And, and yeah, that whole community of scientists, uh, this is this is going to be a huge tool because we're, we're basically going to be exploring the an unknown and unseen epoch in the uh, history of the universe. And, and hopefully we'll learn a lot from it. Uh, so wild. Uh, so if you could have the audience here take away one amazing fact about this telescope for each of you, what would that be? Uh, you go first, Stephanie. <laughs> There's too many amazing One things. amazing fact. Um, the one amazing fact for me about JWST is while it is absolutely ginormous in scale, it is exceptionally light. Um, new technology and innovation has gone into lightweight this whole telescope, this you know building size facility um, to make sure that it weighs less than Hubble, um, which is phenomenal. Um, I think that is just the technological genius that is just at play with making something so that it is capable to do the science that we want to do. Um, it, the, just the challenges that were that they had to face to, to make this something that we could actually put on a rocket was amazing. All right, and Paul? Um, well, just to put something in engineering in perspective, the, uh, you know, the cold side, our heat budget for the cold side is about the um, power emitted by uh, a modern day little tiny Christmas light that you'd hang on, a, that the one, one light in the string that you hang on your Christmas tree, for example. I mean, it's ridiculous. And, and when you consider over 200 kilowatts of solar insulation is hitting the sun side, that's nuts. Um, yeah, you need you need you need log paper to think about this whole thing from an engineering standpoint. And then the um, I, and and back to something we talk, both talked about earlier. I just this thing is such a leap forward in capability that w the discovery, as Stephanie mentioned, the discovery potential is huge. So I'm just this thing is going to do things nobody's thought of, and and it, it just has so much promise. Um, and I guess one more thing engineering wise, it's just, it's complicated and that's part of why it has taken so long. Um, you know, it's got a lot of moving parts because it's a deployable thing. And, um, and you know, we've had to do a lot of testing and a lot of, and the testing has been difficult to, uh, to generate enough evidence that, that we have confidence that this thing is gonna do what it's designed to do and work the way it's supposed to work. So um, it's been a long time coming, but, you know, um, things that are hard take a long time and things that take a long time are expensive. So there you have it. <laughs> yeah. And can you tell me a little bit more about how, like, the journey of this telescope plays into exploration as humans in general and our, like, drive to be curious and learn more about like what's out there that's philosophy holy cow all right you go first Stephanie. <laughs> uh okay let me see if i can get a go at this one um <laughs> so exploration in general we you know i think it all started with um the, the hubble space telescope uh director or um yeah the director of the telescope decided that they wanted to see what they could see um, what Hubble could actually do. And so they allocated some of his own discretionary time to basically stare at a dark spot in the sky that was, you know, a couple of fists away from the moon. And they just stared at it for hours and hours and hours and hours and not really knowing what they were going to find. Once the data came through, um, this, you know, postage stamp square of the sky, they found, you know, tens of thousands of galaxies. And the longer they stared, the more they found. And this just gave us an eye-opening experience um, for the whole astrophysics community that 
there's a lot more that we can do with even just the capability of Hubble. Imagine if we build a telescope that, as Paul was saying, uh, is optimized for studying the distant universe and goes into the infrared. And we can even make it just as sensitive of Hubble, as Hubble, just at longer wavelengths, so that we can really see how far we can see. Um, I think that in and of itself just, just explains why we do what we do is one little thing, one unknown phenomenon, discovery, whatever, it just drives us, it motivates us to do something, the next step. What's the next science question that's going to come out of this telescope? Because once we get up there, there's going to be things that we didn't anticipate, and it's going to drive us to build the next space telescope or the next planetary mission. Um, you can imagine, you know, in your wildest dreams, actually sending spacecraft now to planets around other stars um, and doing the kind of planetary science that we do in our own solar system just now in a different system. Um, sending things as far as we possibly can, just launching it into space, you know, going well beyond, you know, our nearest neighbors um, and seeing how far we can actually go. I think the technology, the innovation, the discovery space is just exactly what humanity is. We have questions. We want to know if we're alone. Is there anyone out there? Um, are there other planets that could that have life that could sustain life? Um, what are these crazy phenomenon that we see? You know, uh, with black holes merging. What are the phenomenon of moons outgassing plumes of water? Um, there's crazy things that we just want to know, and um, I think that's exactly what it is. Oh, definitely. That's super cool. Thank you, Stephanie. And Paul, do you have any thoughts? Uh, well, yeah, I, I do want to say that, you know, telescopes are really powerful tools of exploration because, um, you know, they can reach so much farther than we can ourselves, right, traveling ourselves or sending robots you know i mean stephanie's talking about going to other planets and uh in other systems that's awesome but it'll take a long time and and right now our technology is that you know uh we've sent people the farthest we've sent people is to the moon which is a light second and a half away it's it's a almost a quarter million miles away um mars is Whole heck of a lot farther away we haven't sent people and we and it's a very difficult time sending robots you know we are the very the farthest thing away we've ever sent right now is um voyager voyager one and it is um uh let's see whatever 10 billion times two kilometers is that's how far away it is which is really 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 tiny it only just recently entered interstellar space and it, at, at the speed it's going, it would take it 80,000 years to get to the nearest star. So telescopes are how we can um, explore beyond our very, very immediate neighborhood, at least, for, at least in the near term until we figure out warp drive or something, right? So telescopes are really powerful tools of exploration. They allow us to go where places we, we can't ourselves or nor can our robots and um, we can learn so much and you know I always think of Galileo right he was he didn't invent the telescope the, the credit really goes to this Dutch guy um, named Lippershey uh, um, you know he was for credited with putting two lenses together and you know getting something that that increases angular viewing right which is what a telescope does so um, uh, but he was the first one to point it at stuff in the sky, and he got in a lot of trouble because he was learning things that were kind of not, um, not you know, kind of ran against the grain of conventional thinking and, and stuff that was okay to think at the time. And, uh, you know, that was a crappy little telescope by today's standards. And you know, every time we build a new tool like this um and and look at nature with it we just discover amazing things we never imagined so it's it's um yeah very telescopes are really powerful and this is going to be a powerful one that's wonderful and i love that comparison learning a little bit more about galileo and his predecessor so question for you both how do you feel working on this project uh all right, well, I'll go first. The uh, I'm 
uh, obviously we're both excited. I'm excited. Um, I, I, you know, since I was a little kid, I'm old enough to remember the Apollo missions. So I'm old, right? And that, that was pretty inspiring. And I got my first telescope when I was seven for Christmas. And, um, and uh, I've always been fascinated by, uh, you know, what's out there. And, um, you know, so it's pretty cool to work on something like this where I know it's gonna, it's gonna um, help people rewrite history and expand our knowledge so much. So it's, it's, re it's really cool, you know, day to day, it can be a real pain, right? Like any job, um, this has been a very challenging machine to design, fabricate and build. And uh, there have been existential crises on an almost continuous basis. But, you know, when you look back at it, I suppose, um, when you look back at it, you're like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool to work on this stuff. And it's been, I, I wouldn't want to do anything else. So there you have it. Thank you, Paul. And Stephanie? My phrase of, that comes to mind when you ask is privileged. Um, this is an enormous project, um, international, multiple space agencies all over the world with, you know, pieces of the telescope that came from, you know, the mountains in Colorado to now, you know, um, technology that's been developed and um, carried through from labs in Europe and um, just the innovation, the technology, the collaboration and everybody working together to make this thing happen, um, not only launch successfully, but we've been practicing operating the telescope in and out for you know years now and making sure we know how to work through any issue that could possibly arise um, because it will happen. I mean, we have Hubble going through one of its episodes at the moment, um, but it sounds like things are getting worked through and it takes a team of people to really think about these things and, and get through the hurdles that we may have and probably will have. Um, so I think privilege is definitely uh, the people I've met, the places I've gotten to see, um, the technology, the science, uh, the science alone is just, um, it's going to be tremendous. So um, definitely privilege is. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating to see the work that you all are doing. And it's so cool that this isn't just NASA working on this project. This is NASA working with the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency, countless other teams, and you all coordinating on different time zones all around the world for all of your intense meetings. So it's really cool to see what you're all doing. So with all that said, like what keeps you up at night? thinking about this project? Um, well, if it kept me up at night, I'd be dead by now because there's been things to be, uh, you know, um, focus on for so long. Um, I will say this, though, that, um, you know, the mission's not without risk like any other mission, but we've done everything within reason to and, and we've aggressively managed risk, so we're, we we have confidence. But I, I will tell you that the, the, there will be a size of relief from the engineering community once the deployment is complete, because that's where that really is where a lot of the uh, remaining risk looking forward is. And um, we're, you know, like I said, we've, we've tested it, we know it can work, um, but once that's done, um, I think our risk posture just improves tremendously and then the scientists are going to start drooling because they know that they're going to have this big cold after in space, it's going to be marvelous. So um, that's kind of it in a nutshell for me. Yeah, and, and you, Stephanie? I mean, you're, the engineers aren't the only one worried about the deployments. Um, I'd say the entire world is, uh, but I suppose um, working on the project for as long as I have and watching the process, you know, how the how the cookies are being made, you know, and all the tests and integration and um, 
rehearsals that we're doing, I'm very confident in this, in the team and the engineering and um, how things are actually going to work. So I'd say I'm leaving that stress up to the engineers. And my biggest thing that keeps me up at night is staying on top of my game. Um, there's new science I need to be thinking about. How, how quickly can I get this data published? Um, what is the next thing I want to ask or try with JWST? Um, so I think that's sort of where I am is, you know, I have other telescopes that I am trying to make um, active and engaged so that I'm ready for web and um, yeah. So, uh, you know, as any scientist just trying to stay uh, on top of it. I think All right, very good. So we've got a lot of questions that have come up in the chat. So thank you to everyone for submitting your questions. Keep them coming if you want. Uh, so we have, let's start here with Stephanie. Question from the chat is, where will ground operations take place for the Webb Telescope? Uh, so operations are going to be at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, it's the same place that does operations for the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, we've been, they have our full operations center already in place. We've been using it to practice um, and it's, you know, even communicating with the, the actual physical telescope already um, from Baltimore. So um, that is where it'll be done. Awesome. Very close to Goddard, too. So question, another question from the chat. How will the signal from Webb be transmitted back to Earth? Did NASA have to build any new capabilities for this? Paul? Yeah, no new capabilities. We're using the space network and the deep space network. Um, the uh, We have Omni antennas on the spacecraft that will be used for the first minutes of, of the mission. And then um, early in the mission, we'll deploy a, a medium gain S band and a high gain KA band antenna assembly. And it's that KA band, which is kind of what um, Direct TV runs on, right? But it's a slightly different wavelength, so you won't get interference with the SPN. The, um, uh, that's how we'll get the science data down. Um, and we'll be using the um, S band to uh, do all the, get all the telemetry back and send all the commands up. So we'll be in constant contact with it. Um, the cool thing about the Deep Space Network is, um, you know, it, it's it's three sets of large antennas spaced kind of equally around the planet. You know, Madrid, uh, Goldstone in the southwestern U.S. and near Canberra, Australia. So one is almost always um, in contact. And uh, so we'll be in virtual continuous contact getting telemetry back and being able to command the telescope. So, uh, but yeah, no new capabilities. Um, it's not that unusual from a communication standpoint compared to a lot of other deep space missions. Another question that came in, why is the telescope being launched from French Guiana instead of Cape Canaveral? Yeah, so that, that's a cool story. So, um, you know, back in the early days of web, everybody wanted in on the mission because they recognized the potential of this thing. So um, the Europeans were like, hey, you know, uh, uh, we'll be partners with you guys. Um, uh, we'd love to contribute some science instruments. That's where so much of the cool work is and um, on the science end. And uh, we want the same deal we had on Hubble, which is a guarantee of 15% of the observing time. And observing time is the coin of the realm in the operational time, right? Um, that's what this is all about, making this machine so it can spend time observing and and um, we're like, OK, sure, uh, but we need 15 percent worth of stuff making the telescope in exchange. And they're like, OK, well, um, we couldn't get mirrors from them because that's that's got other applications that are strategic. And we were the leaders in that. And we're the US kind of has the best detectors and IR detectors. And the sun shield was a complicated thing that we had expertise in. Um, not not this design, but things big things like it that get deployed in space, and and uh, so it was hard to take two instruments and add it up and get the fifteen percent. So we're like, hey, you got a nice rocket over there, um, and at the time in the early two thousands, it was the only launch vehicle that had the reliability, um, the high reliability that a, a flagship mission like Webb 
that NASA requires of a flagship mission like Webb. So we said, hey, you know, that Ariane 5 is a pretty nice rocket. How about that? And they're like, okay. So that's how we, that's how they became the contributors of the launch vehicle and the launch services. So um, uh, it saved hundreds of millions of dollars um, in budget and, and, um, and once you commit to the launch vehicle, you kind of you got to stick with it because your design kind of rotates a little bit around the uh, environment that that launch vehicle is going to provide. So it's not like we can just hop off and jump on a SpaceX Falcon 9 or something. Um, plus the Europeans, you know, that's their part of their contribution so they can get a guaranteed minimum amount of time. And oh, by the way, European scientists win over 20 percent of time through a competitive process anyway so that i don't think that 15 percent floor has ever kicked in but they wanted it and we're like we'll give us 15 percent worth of stuff so this is a big chunk of that 15 percent worth of stuff and um it's a very busy spaceport a lot of satellites get launched from there it's it's only 5.3 degrees above the equator and being near the equator is a nice place to launch a rocket from because you get that extra slingshot effect from the earth because that's where the that's where the velocity is highest on the surface of the Earth is at the equator. So if you can, if you have a launch site near the equator, you you can um, get the same thing up in the space for a smaller rocket. So it's it's a it's a busy launch site. A lot of communication satellites that go to geosynchronous equatorial orbital launch from there. Other science missions have been launched from there, like Herschel and Planck got launched together on an Ariane five, and um, uh, so yeah, it's um. That's why. Sorry for the long answer. <laughs> no, thank you. That's great. Uh, another question came in. I bet scientists around the world are dying for the web data. How will you all handle dishing out the first data set? Stephanie? So um, there, there was a competitive process that's already taken place to apply for time um, to use web. Um, anybody in the world uh, that has an uh, affiliation of some sort can apply to use the telescope. Um, there, it is completely open. Um, so that process already happened. Uh, the call was, you know, late last year, and um, reviews went out on all the proposals that were submitted um, this spring. And selections, does the decision was made on which programs would be part of the first year of operations for the Webb Space Telescope. Um, with any given program that's approved, you are. Um, allowed up to 12 months of time to analyze that data and put it into publication before it becomes public to the entire world. There's an archive where that data is stored and housed and accessible to anybody. Um, how quickly the data comes down is a matter of how big the program is. Um, so if you have a very long observation, um, it might take longer for that data to come to you, um, depending on if they have to do multiple sort of visits to that particular uh, target or um, uh, how your program is broken, broken up. So if you're using multiple instruments, you may get all the data from one instrument before you get the data from another instrument. It'll go through some quality uh, control just to make sure that the observations you wanted um, actually happened in the way that you wanted it and it wasn't um, completely annihilated by a cosmic ray or something. So um, there will be some checks put in place, but uh, you'll get the data pretty quickly. Um, just as I said, just depending on the nature of your observation. Um, and as soon as you get it is when the clock starts, uh, the 12 month period starts. Um, some people have waived that. Um, and so there is there is actual observations that are scheduled. Um, part of this was actually designed that way. Uh, there's an early release science program that was approved a few years ago that was just such that it would be data that is available to the entire community so that in cycle two, people have data in hand to help them uh, win time for future um, observing cycles. But this will happen every year. There's a, a proposal and a peer review process. All right, that's very good to know. Okay, we've got some interesting questions coming in from the chat. So I like this one. If we're seeing the first light from the universe, is that time travel? Hard to wrap one's head around this. Anybody want to take that? Um, let me do the engineer version and Stephanie can hit it harder. Um, well, because light travels at a finite speed, and oh, by the way, it's the speed limit of the universe. Um, 
you know, the farther away something is, the uh, the the you're seeing it. You're seeing it at a longer time in the past, right? So when you look at the sun, the sun's eight. It takes eight minutes for the light to get from the sun to here. So you're seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. Um, when you look at the very the farther you look into space, because speed of light is finite, the 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 um the younger that thing is, or the you know you're seeing it as it was a longer time ago. So um uh. You know that that answers that uh, part of that question, but um, the uh, what was the rest of the question? Is that time travel? Oh, it's not really time travel. You're just it just takes time for the light to travel. So you're seeing it as it was a long time ago. So um, so it's traveled time. <laughs> right. Yes. Oh, and and and, and I, I want to make one comment about first light. So so. The, um, if you take an old analog television set, if you still have one in your crawl space, um, and you turn it to channel 112, um, about a 1% of the snow on the screen is the uh, echo of the Big Bang. Um, that happened so long ago that that light has been stretched all the way into the microwave part of the spectrum, which is much longer wavelengths than um, infrared light. Um, that is what we call like the first light in the universe. That, that's when the universe became transparent such that light could propagate. Um, because before then, it was the universe was so hot that ordinary matter, which was only hydrogen and helium basically, was was a plasma. And and um, so if you've seen cool pictures of that are like these pretty pastel greens and blues from WMAP or Planck or, or Kobe, um, those were those are those are pictures of that of that of the first light that kind of traveled. The first light we're trying to see is light from the first luminous objects to form in the universe, which happened not a few hundred thousand years after, which is when that 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 Big Bang echo um, is is from. But a few hundred million years. That sounds like a really long time, but that's when the universe was only a few percent its current age. So it was a it was a an infant slash toddler. And that's when the lights turned on in the universe in terms of things making light, you know, stars, galaxies, stuff falling into black holes, whatever it was. We're not sure what that how that happened and everything and what was first, but that's what we that's what we want to see. And that's that 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 ultraviolet invisible light. Um like I said earlier, it's red shifted, so it's it shows up today as infrared light. Anyway, sorry, Stephanie. I think you covered it. That's a great I answer. Hate, that... I, I kind of hate treading on science because I'm an engineer, so it's no, you did it wonderful. You know, Thank I you, did Paul. Not stay at a Holiday Inn Express. So, <laughs> well, we I have a couple other questions really quickly that have come in on the chat. One of the questions is. Uh, for reference, what would be the spatial resolution of one pixel if Webb took a picture of Earth? Okay. Um, well, the the the, uh, the Stephanie probably knows the plate scales on the instruments better than me, but you know our resolution is milli arc, well milli arc seconds. So I mean, from L two, we're only a million and a half kilometers away, about a million miles away. So by the way, from that vantage point, the Earth just happens to, to subtend half a degree of of the sky. So it looks the same size as the sun does, just like on Earth. The moon's a quarter the diameter of the Earth, but it just happens to be at the right distance that it subtends half a degree and looks like the same angular size as the sun. Um, so Earth happens to be that size. So, gee, if you do the math, you could you could see a fair amount of detail, um, but I can't do the math in my head. Um, and if we did look at the Earth, that would be bad because it means we're pointing the wrong way. So let's hope we never actually do that. But but yeah. Um, but as Stephanie mentioned earlier, she might want to say, you know, she said we can look at objects in the solar system like a tr uh, Triton, the moon around Saturn, that is a really fascinating place, and see macro features on the moving across. And we know it has weather, so we could maybe do you know large scale weather watching, I suppose, right, Stephanie? 
Yeah, there there actually are programs already in place to do such things, like follow the great red spot of Jupiter um, and study it for, you know, the next generation of, of science, um, as well as do things like storms on Pluto. I mean, sorry, not Pluto, uh, Uranus and Neptune. We, we've seen cloud features on them before, and um, we want to know what those storms are all about, how long they survive, and um, what the dynamics are, so... There are definitely programs in place to do these things. Well, thank you both so much for all of this awesome discussion and conversation about NASA's James Webb Space Telescope. We're at the end of the hour, so if you have any additional questions, feel free to write to us on social media at NASA Webb or hashtag NASA Web. We'll be responding because we are always doing that and we have an amazing team. Uh, reaching out to our scientists and engineers so you can get the latest on your questions. So if you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to stay tuned to the next Engage session that will be coming through next month and look out for that information. So thank you again, Stephanie and Paul, for all of your time. We really enjoyed this today. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. It was fun. Yeah. Thank you again to everybody who watched and have a nice rest of your day.